So demos, right? I'm supposed to do demos. Uh, my spatial database, but um, that's not important. I'm here today because I'm worried about you. <laughs> the stakes are really high. You're young, you got your whole lives ahead of you. It's important that you grow up, that you have a healthy, happy life. You gotta make the right choices. This is your brain. <laughs> this is your brain on GIS. <laughs> Let me repeat myself just to make myself clear. This is your brain. This is your brain on GIS. <laughs> okay? And don't start with me, right? I've seen too many lives ruined. I've heard the excuses too many times. Sure, I can handle one hit of GIS. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're tough guys. Right? Well, my friends are doing GIS. <laughs> right? I bet if all your friends are jumping off a cliff, you do that too. Right? I only do GIS when I drink. <laughs> right? That's how it starts, you know, just one. Just with your friends, a few laughs, a few beers. But then the years go by, and one day you wake up, you take a look at yourself in your mirror, and there you are. <laughs> and look, it doesn't have to be this way. There is another way. So let's look at why people do GIS. I mean, I'm a recovering GIS user myself. I understand. There's a lot of positive reasons people do GIS, okay? Interactive data editing tools. It's useful. Attractive cartographic output. It's pretty. Spatial data analysis. You can learn new things. Complex data representations. You can show people cool things about data. But there are cons to GIS. There's only one point of consumption at your desk. The deployment and upgrade requires a license and installation at every desk. And it's really hard to share your view of the data without handing around pieces of paper. It's a big, complex lump of software. And it trains us, it trains us to think that GIS is the one tool to rule them all, right? And that's kind of weird, right? Even on the desktop, we use different tools for, for graphic design, right? We just use InDesign. Uh, for data query, we use Access. Maybe for data analysis, we might use Excel. We use different tools for different things. So why do we only use one tool when we're working with maps? It's time to break free. We don't do GIS. We're information technology experts who understand spatial problems, OK? We store and query spatial information. We analyze spatial information. We symbolize spatial information. We share spatial information. We do spatial IT. And here's the punchline, finally. We do spatial IT on the web. Now, why should we do spatial IT on the web? Let's look at the pros and cons of GIS. Web technology, and it pains me to say this, the server, I'm a server guy, OK. Web technology can now do almost everything we used to do on the desktop. They can do it cheaper. They can do it more flexibly. OK? So the pros, interactive data editing. We can do that on the web. Tim's going to show us some demos about that. Attractive cartographic output. We can do that. We don't have demos of printing, but you can print off the web. Spatial data analysis. We can do that on the web. Complex data representations. Martin's going to show us some demonstrations of that. We can do that on the web, too. And when you're on the web, all the cons of the desktop disappear. The one point of consumption, not a problem on the web, goes away. Deployment and upgrade, just upgrade your server. No deployment problems. Hard copies, not a problem on the web. You just ship around a URL, like Mike Byrne talked about yesterday. And I'm not talking about putting GIS on the web, right? I'm not talking about just translating the one ring of desktop GIS over to web technologies, like, like this super site, right, from my home province of BC. Uh, it's got the classic row of fancy tools that only GIS people understand. Uh, the list of layers, every possible layer in the entire data warehouse. Even the active layer concept, they borrowed it from the desktop experience because everyone knows what an active layer is, right? Uh, it's the one with the dark eye, by the way. Um, and then we got to embed directions right into the user interface because it's so freaking complex that normal folks can't figure it out on their own. This is not the way. So there's a truth 
about web mapping applications we need to examine. Like the truth. The truth came knocking my door and said, and I said, go away, I'm looking for the truth. And so it did. When we're building things, when we're building new apps, so the daily quotidian affairs, um, the apparent requirements for our users, what they say they need as opposed to what they do need, can get in the way of our pursuit of the truth. Um, so my colleague, Ian Schneider, he built this app back when he was an independent consultant. It's a, it's a decision support system, which is to say it doesn't have a single purpose. It's, it's built in the hope of finding a purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't do, it, do this malevolently, right? He didn't do it because he was a consultant. He, he carefully built exactly what the client requested, feature by feature. Now, in theory, it serves everyone. In practice, it serves no one. But after he was done, right, when the pressure deliverer had abated, when he had the time to <laughs> contemplate, the truth came, right? A single decision support application cannot meet every purpose. But on the web, it's possible for each purpose to have their own decision support application. And so we built this example. We just stripped down the original application um, to just a base map and a handful of layers of real-time data that weather managers needed to make decisions about when to do cloud seeding. Um, notice you can't turn the layers on and off anymore. The toolbar on the top is gone. All it is is to just look at the data they need to see to make their decision. No instruction panel. They don't need it. So the truth, every good application has one purpose. And if you can't name that purpose, you shouldn't build the application. I go even farther down this road, and, and I like to say that the best spatial applications have only two layers a base map, and a layer of interest. Um, and here's the best part about the spatial web. Here's the part that blows my mind. Um, the layers don't even have to come from the same place. Like a good web application that appears on your screen like a single composed piece, right? A pretty map, a useful tool, an analytical display. But each component can be served from a different location, from a different server, from a different organization, Entirely. So we've gotten used to thinking about you know GIS. It's the big functional blob, right? A single piece of functionality. Uh, it does everything for us. It mediates our relationship with data, databases, and files. But it's not. It's a collection of functions, right? A GIS is a data access layer to abstract different formats and databases. It's a rendering layer that turns raw data into cartographic output. There's a query and analysis layer to extract pieces of data or transform them, then there's a user interface to allow us to manipulate the data, the styling, the queries, and the analyses. And here's the crazy part, right? These functions don't have to run on the same machine the user sits at, right? They don't even have to run on the same continent. On the web, each function is separable. And an application can bind multiple functions together into one interface, and each of those functions can run on different servers, and each server can be run by a different organization. So I'm going to Canonical, simple example, a two-layer map. A base map to provide context and a layer of interest drawn using a web map service, a remote rendering service. Google can provide the base map, and the remote renderer can provide the overlay. And all that's necessary to synchronize the result is to ensure that both layers are pulled in using the same projection and scale, and the result can be composited in the user's web browser. The user doesn't need to know or care that the map he's seeing is actually produced from two separate places from two separate sources of data, from two separately, completely different organizations, in fact. The user can just get his job done. And here's where we get to the part that gets me really excited. In addition to breaking the rendering function into distributed parts, web architectures also let us distribute the analysis function. So the user can pull analytical results from remote servers. And this is where I start to quiver a little. It's the really good stuff. Because when I say, analytical services, that doesn't mean you need to deploy ArcGIS server, or GeoServer, sorry Justin, or use fancy protocols like WFS or WPS or whatever it is we call their geoprocessing stuff. You can get enough spatial analysis to solve 90% of your problems using just the spatial database. Just a big gray cylinder. I mean, <laughs> the savings on architecture diagrams alone are <laughs> actually huge. So, an open 
geospatial consortium, simple features for SQL database like Postgres has all the functionality we need. It has all the spatial tests and operations you find in middleware like GeoServer, and more important, it has the ability to evaluate complex data processing and summary queries. Uh, like, fire, fire, what are the parcels within what kilometers of this fire? That sounds like an analytical question. How many lines of code should it take to solve it? How about one line, right? Using this one spatial function, a coordinate, and a table of parcel data, we can generate the classic GIS alert list of all the people to phone about the fire. Oh, wait a second, right? I've been talking about integrating services over the web. How do we do this SQL query over the web? <coughs> the answer, thin, 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 tiny little scripts. So here's an example of a web service script in PHP that wraps a SQL query and returns GeoJSON. So why PHP? Because I like it. Everyone else hates it. But, uh, but it has dollar variables, it has semicolons, so it reminds me simultaneously of Perl and C. <laughs> <laughs> so a simple script takes in URL parameters uh, and things that are easy things to generate from a click on a web page and it spits back a JSON answer. First, connect to the database. Second, here's the SQL we're going to run. Uh, it's our example phone list query for a point of interest. Now we're going to return GeoJSON, note at the top, we've got a little function to do that, and the database supports output in that format. Create a prepared statement using the SQL. This gives us a little protection against SQL injection attacks. Then we execute the query, passing the X and Y from the HTTP call from the click on the user interface. And now we're ready to return the answer. Send a content type, JSON, start the JSON feature collection, iterate through the result sets for each result, stick in a comma, stick out the GeoJSON feature, uh, phone number goes into non-spatial properties, loop completes, close it out, close the data connection, and you're done. So, okay, maybe you're thinking that was not actually simple, that was kind of complex, that was like six slides. And I'm a generous and empathetic guy, but frankly, you're wrong. <laughs> That's a really simple example, right? The whole thing's on one page, it's really small. You connect, you run some SQL, you return the result in the format of your choice, you disconnect, right? 12 lines, 12 lines long. And really, that's just 12 lines of boilerplate, right? The important stuff's just the one line. The logic is bound up into just one SQL statement. And this is a really simple one. You now we can do so much more. And please don't get hung up on the fact that my example used PHP. I like PHP. But you can write simple database wrapping web services scripts in any language at all. Okay, you can write them in Perl, I encourage that. You write them in Ruby, Python, ASP, even full languages like Java, C Sharp, C++. The important thing here is that it's easy to tie your database into a web app and to make use of all the logic inside that database. This is fabulous, right? We have an architecture that allows a web browser application to call into a server with a simple parameterized query and get back the result you can directly process using JavaScript. So the amount of software you need to deploy is minimal. The system complexity is low, but the functional return is high. <laughs> okay, you're not impressed. So here's some questions I can answer with one line of SQL, and which therefore can potentially be bound into a spatial web application using my technique. So we've seen this one. How many people live within one kilometer of? What's the average elevation of? How far away from me is the nearest school, well, base, helicopter pad, Thai restaurant? It's time to pray. What direction is Mecca? Start thinking mobile phones, right? You don't even have to click to make this work. What's the average home price in this neighborhood? You're walking around with your phone. When's the next bus going to get here? Where's that plane going? We're going to get a drink around here. One line of SQL. Go to the right tables. These questions can all be answered in one line of SQL, which means they can be exposed onto the web with just 12 lines of scripting glue, which means that you can provide that service and answer these complex spatial questions for any spatial web application in your organization or in the world. And you can provide the service to multiple users without any extra software deployment. And because that same service can actually feed different applications, because it's just one component among many, you get a new database with better data, you can upgrade the service for all your users simultaneously. Okay, wow, so I assume you all want one of these now, right? It's amazing, it slices, it dices, it plays with people now. So the next few talks are going to show some web services in action, and when you see them, remember that what you're seeing is just one instance of how the service can be deployed. Each service can be remixed into different instances, different interfaces, different contexts. As professionals, it's time we rethought how we approach the job of doing spatial and map work. 
we don't do GIS. That's not our job. We query data. We visualize patterns. We make maps. We share our findings. We help folks make sense of the world. We don't do GIS. That's not our job. We do spatial IT on the spatial web. This is your brain on GIS. This is your brain on the spatial web. Thank you very much. Thank you.